Nice. You know, from the Supreme Court when they do the final redistricting, we might have to move a little bit, but it's pretty much the same. You got Chris. I just I got seven thirty. Yep. So I'm going to call this meeting of the Public Safety Committee to order. Okay, we'll start with roll call. Uh, we are missing Supervisor Burke, who is excused, and Supervisor Milliken. We'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I forgot to do the affidavit of posting. This agenda was posted in the office of the county clerk on the 9th day of February 2022. Notice was sent to the West Bend Daily News, Express News, WIBD, WMVZ Radio, WTKM Radio, My Community Now, Hartford Times Press, Kewaskum Statesman, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Okay, uh, motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. moved by Supervisor Marquardt, second. I can't, I wasn't at that meeting. I think you can still second to okay. oh, All right, so second by Supervisor Garner. Questions on the consent agenda? Nope. Okay, um, then all in favor of accepting the consent agenda say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. All right, first discussion item is the Badger State Sheriff's Association Safety First Initiative. So it's kind of a short uh, topic, but I just kind of wanted to fill the public safety board in on it. So they, the Badger State Sheriff's Association, which is uh, every sheriff in Wisconsin kind of belongs to it. Um, they had a private anonymous donor that wanted to give specifically to sheriff's offices throughout every sheriff's office in Wisconsin, um, uh, a donation of uh, money that, sh that had to be used towards public safety gear that was specifically designed for um, uh, like a critical incidents, immediate threat type of thing. The donor had uh, uh, kind of a, I would say a wish list, but things that they that they wanted us to consider. They included uh, um, tactical gear, um, shields, uh, night safety uh, or night vision uh, capabilities, drones. Uh, less lethal type uh, uh, equipment. So um, Badger State Sheriff's is not a nonprofit organization. So they teamed up with uh, uh, Barron County Law, uh, Law Enforcement Foundation. I think it is in there of uh, 5013C. So that's that's why Barron County was kind of involved in it because they kind of were the, uh, they took in the money and distributed it. So what we did is we looked at, uh, um, I kind of, I'll, I'll be very honest, I kind of looked at the wants versus the needs type of thing. And uh, this was kind of an opportunity to get the, maybe the want versus maybe the need, because this was, this was supposed to be stuff that we're not, that was not budgeted for, that was, that was extra. So um, one of the gaps that we really saw, and I, I've seen it firsthand uh, on multiple tactical calls, especially out in rural areas, is that we don't have night vision capabilities. We, we had them on our, our sniper rifles. Um, but we don't have them for the operators. And it is just gut wrenching. Uh, uh, I've been out on the, uh, the OIC on a couple of calls where guys flee out at night and uh, arm subjects. And uh, you're really putting officers in danger because the, the, the bad guy at that point is that he's completely at advantage. Uh, so we, we really, if we, if we try not to do searching at night, uh, because of that. Um, so we started testing out some night vision equipment that the, um, similar to what the military wears, that they're the, the binoculars, I think you're called it, that, that flip down. And uh, it is absolutely amazing technology. Uh, we, we had a couple of sets that, uh, that we had operators try out. And quite honestly, now they actually want to do the searching at night because it flips the tables completely. That uh, um, it's it's unfair now. Um, so that that's what we we put a bulk of that money towards is uh, outfitting. Um, I think we have eighteen. It's a multi jurisdictional team. I think there's eighteen operators on it. Um, so we we're outfitting um, the entire tactical team with that capability. That took a, a it was so we were given. Um, 
I think it was like twenty two thousand, twenty two thousand seven hundred dollars. I think so. A bulk of that money went towards the, the night vision uh, capabilities, and the other thing we were, uh, we wanted was another drone. Um, so we we uh, we found those to be extremely helpful. I, I was kind of reluctant when we first uh, started using them, but they have proved to be just such an effective tool. Um, not for, not only for locating people, but investigative tools and mapping tools. Um, so that was another thing kind of on the, the wish list for them. So that's, uh, um, and it was kind of a, a quick turnaround time. The, the, um, I think the, the donor wanted to give the money in last year. So for a tax deduction, I'm assuming, and then they really wanted us to spend the money quick. So that's why it, um, they, I would have liked to have come here and said, this is what I want to do, but uh, they, they kind of put the, the heat to it and said, order stuff, get it here. So we already have uh, the drones already here, um, the night vision stuff, uh, some, some of the equipment is here, not everything yet. So it was really just to kind of fill you guys in on uh, if you, you know, it's, uh, we didn't we didn't spend tax dollars to to accomplish that. It's it really enhances the safety for our personnel and capabilities. And our the drone the drones are uh, flare capable as, as well, yes, right? Yeah, yeah. So you got infrared. Yeah, yeah correct. Kind of night vision yeah. option on those. Yeah, well. and, um, it, it's they're phenomenal tools. And like I said, a little big brother ish type of thing when we first got them, but uh, they we've used them several times, uh, um, and not only for the, the tactical type calls, but even like our accident recon. Um, they have a program that they use that uh, we don't have to shut the roads down for nearly as long as we used to. They, they, they fly the drone over a couple of different times, a couple of different heights, and um, it really opens, you know, opens the roads up quicker. So, you know. It's nice. I mean, you can locate them. You locate them with, with the drone, with the night vision. But then when you got to come up on them and you don't have the night vision, you're still at. Right. Yes. Yeah. You're still at. Yeah. You know, it's like they, they could be waiting in ambush, yep. you know, and you know, this way you're able to see and know exactly where they are when you're at, at perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, the other really advantage with the drones, too, is that it allows us a live feed into our command post so we can put the drone up and we can actually, the command can actually see what's going on. We've never, ever had that capability before. Mm -hmm. Cool. What kind of flight time do you get on those? Oh, I I want to say, let me like 20. I think it depends a little bit on the, the wind. If it's, yeah. Yes, uh, but it's like yeah, well. 20 minutes probably is, uh, and yet we have multiple batteries, so it's, you know, we can, yeah. you know, just bring it back, you know, put different uh, different batteries in them. Okay. Interesting. Very generous offer. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if you do the math on that, if it's 25,000 for 72 count, I think it's like, I don't know, 1.5 million, 1.8 million, something like yeah. that. So, and I have no idea where this donation came from. I, and write a thank you note. Yeah. Don't say thank you. Yeah. That's what it is. But you got those night vision goggles and that pretty reasonable if you got 18 of them. Yeah, so oh, that's, that's a good point. So we uh, we chose to actually lease them versus okay. buy them. And there's a big uh, advantage to that for us. I'm not usually a fan of leasing stuff, um, but um, if they are wrecked, um, then we just get them replaced. And more importantly, Every we get new stuff all the time. It's right. That so that yeah, that's, that's that's a good point. We're actually leasing them versus buying them. And I do that out when I go out west. I lease an ad out there for two months, always every year. And that night vision stuff, and that when we go for a mountain lion and yeah. for coyotes. So and that that, that that twenty whatever we spent on it, that's not the actual lease cost per year because we had to outfit all the hard the mounting kits and everything so that uh, that that we purchased. That's it's just purchased. the units themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah, very nice. yeah. Um, were there any strings with this private money at all? No. Okay, good. Not seeing that at all because we don't yep. even know who the donor is. Yep. yep. All right. Good. Yeah, that's one thing after the uh, 2020 elections with uh, all this Facebook money that came into a few communities is what strings are attached. And so here it is done. That's good. Yep. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I don't even know who knows who the donor is, but the, none of the sheriffs that are receiving the money do. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, right. <laughs> yep. That's exactly it. All right, let's move on to the radio project update. 
All right, it's been quite a while since we've been able to update the Public Safety uh, Committee on the, the radar project. Administrative services, we've been dealing with the land acquisition and stuff like that, but we thought we made a good time for us to kind of just go through um, the status of the, the current radio project. So um, we have a proposed 99 year lease that uh, is very, very close to being accepted by both the county and the town of Aaron. Um, uh, I, uh, I think the, the, the fundamentals of it have been agreed upon. It's just the, the procedurally the town of Aaron is going through some things to get it actually signed, get it back to the county executive for a signature, but I, I'm, I'm pretty certain that's going to happen. Um, but that agreement um, really places the tower at the uh, the Highway 83 site north of Thompson, northwest of Thompson, uh, which was really the original site that we proposed. How long was that? Uh, we first went to the town. Yeah, more than a year ago. Yeah, over, over a year ago. That's a complete 360 to where we we were. Um, so, but uh, right now our radio vendor is going to be working with the town zoning administrator uh, to obtain the necessary approvals and permitting to, for the actual construction of it. Um, what my recommendation to the county is, so we still own the property that the county board um, agreed to buy at 83 and 167, I'll, I'll call it the Holy Hill property, the We Energy's old site. Uh, we, so we still own that. Um, my recommendation to the county is that we retain possession of that property until at, at least the, the, the tower, the new tower is built. Um, the reason why I say that is that controversial site is still our backup site if something goes wrong with the, the town gravel pit site. Uh, and there, there could be a, a couple of things that could go wrong yet, I doubt it. Um, but uh, you know, if this lease for some reason doesn't get finalized, that's one potential problem. Um, there were, we need to go through the zoning um, process for the town. Um, if there's anything that goes haywire with that, um, we're going through that application process now, but don't know for sure. Um, the other one, the other, I don't think it's a huge concern, but it could be is all of the NEPA studies that we did, like the environmental studies, they're all done for the town gravel pit site with the exception of the soil borings. They weren't able to get that done before the ground froze. So if something happens with those soil borings and that site is not workable, highly unlikely, unlikely but possible, um, the Holy Hill, the, we, the uh, Webco site is still our, our backup plan. Um, so that, that would be my recommendation that we, yeah. that we keep them approved. Yeah. Um, so on um, January 24th, um, the county signed a $1.6 million contract with Raycom, that's a, the, our radio uh, vendor, um, to complete phase two of the radio project. And if you remember, phase two is kind of the infrastructure part of the, the process. Um, and just a couple of bullet points of what that includes. So that uh, will include the construction of uh, 185 foot uh, public safety rated class three public safety rated uh, monopole tower uh, in the village of Kewaskum, um, right next to our current site where we have a shorter lattice structure. So um, the monopole will go up, the lattice structure will go down uh, to obtain the necessary approval and permitting and construct a new 300 foot um, class three public safety tower in the town of Aaron, either on the, the hopefully on the, the town gravel pit site. Um, and then to take all that, the, the, um, the existing comp or, uh, equipment that we have on the American Tower site, the other one, take all that stuff down and put it back up on, on the new tower. Uh, there's gotta be some uh, structural modifications done to our Slinger Tower. We have another tower at uh, 41 and Lovers area. Um, that's gonna have to be reinforced and uh, new light. we're gonna put LED lighting on as long as they're up there doing it. <laughs> Um, there's, we're going to be installing new UPS units, and upgrade the electrical systems, and replace all the generator batteries at all of the sites. The, the UPS is an uninterrupted power source. That just, uh, if there's a power loss, it, uh, that UPS kicks in until the generators start up and then it, uh, it goes on to generator power. Um, there's, we're 
this is not shocking at all, but there's a currently a delay in construction materials. Uh, so the best guess that we have is the tower construction is hopefully going to be in July-ish uh, and completed before the end of this year. Uh, during our phase two, um, phase two phase, um, there's going to be a parallel running um, Raycom contract with Ozaki County to erect another 300 foot um, public safety tower. It's kind of in a 5,000 block of highway Y, but in, in Ozaki County, they call it Pinnacle. Um, uh, so the agreement, if you if you're just through, if you weren't familiar with that, um, we are going to split the costs of that tower 50-50. We are waiving any of the rights to any of the revenue, but there's a big but to that. Um, it's not going to cost us anything forever um, to put the, any of our equipment on a tower, so there'll be no lease at all. That we're currently paying, uh, you know, like forty-eight thousand dollars a year down in down in Aaron. Um, and then on top of that, um, they're also going to allow us to put another repeater on their. It's not the Mequon; it's called the Mequon site. It's a, a golf course, I think, a county-owned golf course. So we're actually putting the equipment on that tower to make the jump from Mequon to Germantown. And uh, Ozaki County has been a great partner. They're not going to charge us anything for that as well. So, um, yeah, we're forking out half of the, the tower for them, but in the long run, it's you know, it's going to pay off for us. And then while doing that phase two, um, that that's mostly Raycom. Um, we will still be busy. Um, our share of staff is going to be going around to um, all of the countywide radio users and obtaining accurate uh, um, VHF, the old radio counts um, so we can um, you know so we can do negotiations with uh, Raycom or Harris about the, the actual end user equipment. Um, we, we plan on kind of combining phase three and four into one project just for economies of scale type of thing. Um, and uh, a part of that will be decommissioning equipment at the Farmington site because the Farmington site that release that will disappear because we'll have Pinnacle. So that's, that's another uh, saving money there as well. Um, and then we're also going to be uh, relocating, repurposing the existing and Farmington Aaron generators to Slinger and Richfield, um, removing the existing VHF radios and installing all the 700, new 700 systems, um, and also installing some mutual aid repeaters and paging bases at the tower sites and the new logging recorders. So a, really a whole new backbone of the, the system. So we're, we're hopeful that the phase three and four is probably gonna be 18 to 24 months in that neighborhood. So our anticipated completion date of it uh, is 2025. It always seems to be getting backed up a little bit. Uh, but that's kind of the, 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 the road plan. So I brought Rob here because if you have any specific questions about it, he's my, my go-to guy. He's kind of running it for the, the sheriff's office. Okay, questions? Um, do we have to wait till what stage to, until testing and stuff can begin? Because I know that was a big deal with the- it's, They always try- yeah, yeah. So they always try to do it with full foliage, meaning all the leaves on the trees. Um, so um, you just you can't do it in fall, in <coughs> winter. In spring, so you're looking for summer and fall. <laughs> That's when the final test. Let's do these new uh, 700 transmitters, 900, Se 700, 700, yeah. Do those have to be up and operational before any of that testing can begin? Yes. Okay, so kind of after phase two. Yes, yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it could probably be done before phase four is done, I'm assuming. Is it, is it, so phase three is basically, phase two is the building of the civils, the towers. Phase three would be installation of the 700 equipment on the towers. And then phase four is the end user gear and installation in squad cars, DPW trucks, fire trucks. So once the stuff is on the towers itself, that probably when some of that testing will take place. Um, and, but it's going to go parallelly. You know, everything's going to kind of happen so that we can. Yeah, so both, both systems of transmitter will be on the towers and operating kind of at the same time, right? Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly at what point they flipped the light switch. <laughs> I guess I'm not exactly sure, but yeah, we, we're not gonna have any downtime. Right. Yeah. Um, there was a question a while back about um, for the different users, like the towns and their 
volunteer fire departments <coughs> if they were going to have to pay money for the replacement <coughs> units. And I think the plan was to um, have the county incur that cost and just swap out the units for them. Is that still the plan? And do we as a county board need to take any action to affirm that? So the last part of your question, I'm not entirely sure. What I can tell you is that the resolution that uh, that you approved quite a while ago included those those costs. Um, and I'll tell you why, I, why I'm an advocate for that is uh, because once we go to the 700 system, the old radios, the VHF, they'll cease to work. They can't, they can't work. Yeah. So you're really, you're really forcing the, the municipalities onto the new system. Um, so it's kind of what we did initially back in 2007 and eight, the, the county purchased everything. Um, so I've been an advocate of it. It's a big cost, uh, uh, yeah. probably five to yeah. six million dollars, probably. Um, but you're, uh, it would be very painful for the small fire departments and small municipalities to have to have to fork up. What is a, a mobile radio ish? <clears throat> I mean, yeah, seventy five hundred dollars. I mean, that's for a pretty cost. Yeah. 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 So, so it's, it's big, big yeah. money. Yeah, no, I'm in agreement with doing it that way. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to make sure that was still the plan yeah. and that, uh, you know, any action we need to take to make sure of that, that we take. So, yeah. I get asked uh, almost uh, every fire chief's meeting that I'm at, if that's still the plan too. <laughs> <laughs> they, are, they are very, very concerned about that and, and I, justifiably so. No. Well, we don't like mandates, so. We're not like the state. We don't do unfunded mandates. <laughs> Put it that way. <laughs> yep. Other questions? Okay. okay. Uh, it's like then, progress. Yeah. Then let's talk about next generation 911. I'm going to hand that off to Steve, sir. Well, I'm by no means an expert on next generation 911 and learning as I go here. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, so I've kind of been studying it for about a year, and so I think I got the nuts and bolts of it. But um, most public safety answering points in Wisconsin currently use analog technology on circuit switch based hot bell tech style technology to operate their 911 systems. Um, these legacy systems are not interconnected with one another, uh, they're, they're standalone, and each agency has them, um, and they operate independent of each other. Each time a new technology emerges, like wireless calling or voice over IP or any sort of new technology, um, add-ons have to be bought for these legacy systems to be able to make them work. <clears throat> um, comparatively, next generation 911, also called NG911, is an inter-based, internet-based technology. So in lieu of it going through the phone lines and things like that, it uses a secure IP network that the state is calling an SENet, uh, emergency services, network. This was developed in response to advancing technology such as text and video to 911 and automatic collision detection, which automobiles are coming with. If they get an auto, if they get a collision, it'll automatically send something on the system. Um, NG911 has the ability to connect 911 calls faster because IP stuff is quicker than analog systems. Uh, they obtain more accurate caller location, so it can pinpoint down you know, closer to where a person's calling and it can transfer large amounts of data from PSAP to PSAP. The other benefit is it can also receive text, photos, and videos from 911 callers and take those videos and push them back out to responders. So, you know, where we would tell and try to paint a picture with words, in the future, we may be doing that with a picture to the, the firemen or police officers. Um, and it also provides near instant backup to any PSAP in the state that would be on this system. So now we have to have designated PSAP as our backup Theoretically, you could move all that stuff anywhere to any PSAP during it, during an outage, whether it's planned or unplanned. So the Wisconsin Department of Military Affairs Office of uh, Emergency Communications is statutorily responsible for implementing this system in Wisconsin. This office recently contracted with AT&T to build and maintain the state's SENet. Um, and they would like to start putting PSAPs on the SENet beginning in fiscal year 22 which I think for the state starts after July 1st. Uh, just a little tidbit of information, as of in 2019, there were 122 PSAPs in Wisconsin throughout the 72 counties. Um, in the state's recently approved biennial budget, the legislature allotted $6 million in fiscal year 2022 
um, specifically to upgrading PSAPs to be able to um, incorporate this new next generation 911 technology and another 1.5 million in fiscal year 23 to update the GIS systems. Uh, and Eric Damcott, I think, has spoken to the board in previous sessions kind of about that. Um, by statute, currently, only one PSAP per county will be awarded this funding. And proposed rules that uh, Office of Emergency Communications is working on will require that the county board will have to be, will be the ones that will identify which PSAP is eligible for that grant funding. Um, if the current rules are, if the current proposed rules are enacted by the legislature, um, the sheriff's office would be the only PSAP in the county currently eligible for consideration. There's some criteria they have to have two people working at every time and blah, blah, blah. So, but again, those are proposed rules because the legislature still has got to, the oversight has got to approve those rules. Now the sheriff's current legacy 911 system uh, will be end of life October of 2022. So this fall, so at t will no longer write a maintenance contract for us. So this is the last year. Um, I don't think they're gonna let us fail, but we'll be paid as you go after that. Uh, that said, uh, the proposed grant funding schedule should work well with our current end of life equipment, uh, provided everything goes right. If it doesn't, we did uh, put $300,000 in the 2023 capital improvement plan um, to buy it ourselves should the funding fall through or something else change. But um, that will be a project we'll have to work on. Uh, in keeping with Wisconsin home rule structure, participation in the SENET will be voluntary. Uh, the state isn't going to mandate communities to do it. Um, but the, those communication centers not eligible for funding uh, will be on the hook 100% financially to pay for the both the PCF equipment as well as the SENET maintenance monthly maintenance. <laughs> kind of asked uh, what those would look like, what those costs would look like, and it's so premature that the uh, gal at the state that's running, it wasn't able to give me any real rough numbers, but it could be in the thousands of dollars per month range to maintain that. Um, those who wish to do nothing can con continue to use their legacy equipment. However, that's gonna create a patchwork of systems across the state. Uh, the state. Um, and you know, voluntarily, voluntariness will, have, will likely be reassessed by the state in the future, so that a standardized level of service will be available. But um, that's probably things to come. Uh, the Office of Emergency Communication is going to be conducting regional meetings this spring, and our meeting for uh, Southeast Wisconsin is scheduled for March 30th. Don and Waukesha, I'm hoping that we'll have a lot of answers to questions that we all have. Um, after this meeting, it is our plan to sign up for the state's SENET because that contract came out, I think, already in January. They're looking at us. And so I think once we get a better idea, it's, it'll be time to move for us and sign that. Um, and then we'll immediately switch into that phase where we start working with our vendor to try looking at uh, updating our call handling equipment and trying to put together some sort of a proposal and see you know, what we need and what it's going to cost. That's the best update I can give you right now. Okay. okay. Uh, questions? So it's coming. It's coming. <coughs> and it's so the best thing that we can do for right now is stay on it. Right. If AT&T is, you know, getting away from it, all those costs are going to be borne by the taxpayers otherwise if something does go wrong. Well, ironically, AT&T got the, the, net, the state contract to build the SE net. So while we're kind of moving away from that mob bell based technology, mob bell is in fact developing the next yeah, internet based yeah, technology. So. so isn't it kind of like moving from the radio system that we have today over into the 700, what it looks like to all the rural places, you know, the, the fire departments and everything else, isn't AT&T doing the same thing? Yep, yeah. it's kind of the same thing. It's all kind of, even your portable radio now, right? It's, it's all, it's a computer now, it's not. It's not switches, it's not analog, so, and this is going to be working the same way. Yeah, so at some point we're going to ask the Public Safety and the full county board for that resolution authorizing, designating the Sheriff's Office as the, the piece after to receive that. Grant. Actually, I haven't already written as a draft, but I don't know exactly what all the, the rules are until it's finalized. Um, but just to give you a comparison, so um, we dispatch our, um, for about 70,000 county residents are, are because we dispatch for the, some of the municipalities already. So we're by far the, the largest uh, PSAP in the county. Um, 
Yeah, how many are, others are there? That was going to be my question. So, so it's West Bend, yeah. uh, Germantown, and Hartford. So there's okay, so just three other three other ones. Yeah. Okay. So this is going to have to kind of force the, their hand. I mean, they're going to have to make the decision for themselves. Yeah. Um, Stay on the legacy or yeah. come come board with us. And the, to Rob's point, the, the bad part is you know, if, if they stay on the legacy equipment, you it's, it really is that patchwork. So you're, you're driving through whatever municipality doesn't upgrade and, and you don't get that text to 911 call and you don't get the video feeds. And, yep. um, so that that's really problematic. Um, so they either have to be all in or not. And they'd have to pass it over to us for certain things any, as well, right? Um, in terms of calls? It, um, it's usually the... That technology should be able to pinpoint where I'm assuming that if you're in the city of X, yeah. the system will know you're in the city of X. Um, but if they if they don't upgrade, we'll probably be doing more transferring to them than the vice versa. Okay. Yeah. So we're, we're already receiving all the the, lamp, the cellular and one one calls. That's not going to change. Um, but it's, I think it's going to be those those landline based calls. Yeah. You know, that's not going to be that's going to still come through on the legacy system for the ones that don't want to jump onto the SNN. Are we keeping everybody informed of what we our knowledge is of this already, so they you know can make an informed decision? But, um, I've had conversations with the the, the the other police chiefs, so everyone knows it's there um, and it's looming. Um, so yes, I, I'd say that they're. They know it's coming. So well, they might have some fright because of budgets, you know, constraints. Sure. They might have some fright there. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure I understand. If I am the city of Hartford, I'm going to have three choices. Stay on the old system and pay all the recurring costs, pay as you go for any maintenance and that. Um, upgrade to the new system at my own expense as the city of Hartford, for example, or transition to County 911. Is that, that, is that the choices municipalities have? I think that's, yeah. yeah. I think it sums it up. And if, uh, if a municipality <laughs> chose to transfer to, to our 911 center, is that something we would then bill them for, or is that something that we would just take on the, the conversations I've had with the county uh, executive, and uh, I've never been an advocate for for going out and, and, and trying to make it happen. But if, if yeah. a municipality comes to us and, and wants it done, um, the discussions I've had with the county executive, at least, and that's that's one piece of the pie, is that the county would just be willing to take on those expenses. Yeah. So they'd have three choices, and two of them cost money, or they could eliminate a cost by transferring right. to our 911 center. Absolutely. Is that kind of the picture? That, yeah, I think it's yeah. very accurate, yeah. It's, yeah. Mm -hmm. And right so now- The cost is likely probably just a personnel issue if like all three us. came aboard, yeah. it would be a person, you know, we'd probably have to add people. Yeah, yeah, so it would be, it would, it would increase the cost for the county, there's no doubt about yeah. it. And right now, if somebody calls 911 from a cell phone, from anywhere in the county, it first comes to the county dispatch center, and then goes to the local community. Right? That's correct. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Having it come right in and to be able to dispatch immediately saves a lot of time. Minutes. If you're looking at like a fire, if it's a if it's a minute <coughs> fire, it, you know, in a minute it might be too late. Yep. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about, and you know, when you talk about funding, and I don't know if everybody's aware of this, but early on when cell phones came in, there was a tax put on the cell phone specifically for 911 and, and for public safety. That money was not <laughs> dedicated to where it should have been. It was it was like our social security. They took the funding and they took they stripped the about two thirds of it, right? It went back into the general fund. We got left roughly a third of that money. So that next gen, you know, when, when Rob's talking about all the different, well, grants, we gotta do this, we gotta do this, we gotta do it. All these hoops we have to jump over are because our legislature failed to dedicate that money to where it was supposed to be. So, um, you know, it, it's, 
you know, we've talked to our legislators over and over about about this. There's there's other issues within the state budget where they do that too, where money is dedicated to certain things and they take it, put it in the general fund instead of dedicating it. So this is what's going to cause some of the funding issues and there'll be a lot more funding available to get this done. Um, and it wouldn't cost, it wouldn't be coming out of the, you know, the, the local, the, the county taxpayer's pocket. It would be coming out of the, the big, you know, the, the big cell phone, uh, you know, yeah. budget. So. Yeah. so I think it's important to remember too, though, that much of what I report to you is that are those proposed rules that, they, that they're pushing forward to the legislature. So there could be some changes there. I think yeah. the way it's explained to me, there's a legislative oversight committee that looks at these rules and then actually enacts them. Yep. And they're they're hoping that that's going to kind of happen <coughs> with the new budget starting in July. So that's kind of our best guess is that by July, this thing can be off to the races. Mm -hmm. okay. Other questions on this? No. Good. Okay, then I think at this point, our next meeting is going to be Wednesday, March 16th at 7.30 a.m. And we're gonna go into closed session uh, for the jail tour. So I need a motion to go into closed session. motion. Okay, Supervisor Gannering, seconded second. by Supervisor Markford. Now uh, we gotta do a roll call vote. So signify by saying aye or nay. Joe Gannering, aye. Randy Markford, aye. And Chris Fassard, aye. So at this point, we will go into closed session. The only thing I'll say is that if you are a CCW holder, um, completely legal here, not so much over there. So <laughs> <laughs> I was going to mention that.